Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ISTE Young Educator Podcast. This is episode 9 on February 23rd in the year 2015. I am Bill Selleck, one of your co-hosts, and with me... I am Christy Andre. Hello. Robert Prunvist. Hello. Jennifer Schley-Reed. Hi, everybody. And also joining us tonight, very special, we have Stephen Anderson. He is a learner, blogger, speaker, uh, author, dad. Um, he's been a presenter and keynoter at a bunch of different educational technology conferences, including ISTE. Um, he's an author of three books, one being The Relevant Educator, How Connectedness Empowers Learning. Um, he's also responsible in helping create hashtag EdChat, um, and he's been recognized for many awards, including Twitter of the Year and uh, Microsoft Heroes of Education Award, along with a 2013 BAMI Award. Quite the bio there for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Um, so, hey okay, guys, I thought we'd start off with some epic ed tech moments of the last month. Uh, I was just talking today with some second grade teachers at our school, and they are, um, I guess we could say, edu stoked to be using, to start to be using Minecraft in the classroom. They have this big project where they've been building communities, and they used to build them actually out on a field, and inevitably they would get destroyed with rain, um, and they want to use Minecraft this year. So, awesome edu win with that. That is really cool, um, and I've had a really fun experience recently using what I'm calling EdTech Buddies. Essentially, um, kindergarten and fourth graders are being paired together, and they did this whole project using Explain Everything. So fourth graders learned it first, then they became the teacher and showed the kindergartners how to use it. I did a similar thing with first grade, pairing them with third grade to help them learn how to use Keynote on the iPad. It just makes my life a lot easier, but it's really cool for them to see collaborating and communicating with these different age groups. So that was my moment. That's awesome. And uh, so there's this thing going on in the Bay Area called LearnStorm, which is Khan Academy. Um, and it's all about basically competing with other cities and schools to try to see how much you can grow in math. Um, and I didn't even know that any of our schools had started to participate because I hadn't started to push it out at all yet. Um, but we were tweeted and told that one of our schools has the most hustle. So I guess they, they're, they're working kind of the hardest on this. Um, so it's pretty awesome that without even sending anything out, without even talking to any of the teachers about it, they're driving it on their own. That's really cool. And if you guys have some great things to share with um, the community, the Young Educator community, don't forget to join us on the Young Educator PLN community and um, our online ISTE community at isti.org slash yen. Y-E-N, uh, to connect with other young educators, share stories like those from around the world, go Epic Yen, and of course, remember to always hashtag that out on, is or on Twitter with hashtag Epic, capital Y-E-N. And um, now we're going to turn to the spotlight interview with our wonderful guest, Stephen, and um, I'm going to start with the first question. Actually, uh, the ISTE Award nominations um, have been out for a while, and they're going to be open now through February 28th, so we have a little bit of time yet about the rest of this week. Um, as an ISTE Award judge, um, what are you looking for in a nomination? So thank you, everybody, for, for having me. It really, uh, it's an honor to be here, and I appreciate um, appreciate the invitation. So yeah, so ISTE Award. So this is, um, this is the Third, second or third time I've had the honor of judging ISTE awards, and um, one thing that 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 really strikes to me. So the, you know, no matter the category, so if it's you know you know a teacher or a leader or, um, or or any of those categories, I'm what I'm really looking for is two things. One, how the 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 award winner would. Uh, or does exemplify what it means to be a member of ISTE. Um, so how are you uh, living, learning, and teaching um, the ISTE standards? How are you ensuring that students are digitally ready? How do you ensure your, you, yourself that you're digitally ready? How are you ensuring that other educators are digitally ready? Uh, how are you living the ISTE, you know, the ISTE mindset? But the second thing that I, that really that really speaks to me is true innovation. So there's lots of great teachers who do lots of great things every day. Uh, they're they're clearly evident by by all of the the epic wins that you all talked about today. There's some incredible things that happen every single day 
in classrooms when it comes to when it comes to education and bridging the gap with technology what really speaks to me are those ones that really that that give me goosebumps when i read them that 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 really speak to the the way that teachers are innovating in their classroom they're really truly doing something different that has a major impact on the learning for kids or if it's a leader how that leader has empowered teachers to to do something different that they couldn't do before and and how they're they exemplified the themselves bridging that gap with technology so i really look for those ones that that really stand out. Again, there are plenty. Everybody who applies, you know, for the most part, is a wonderful educator, or they wouldn't they they wouldn't be nominated. But I, what I really look for are those truly innovative educators, or those truly innovative leaders who are who exemplify what it means to do things differently. When when we talk about there's there's a need um, for doing things different in education. Fantastic. Yeah. Good answer. <laughs> So, so I have a little bit more of a personal question. I see that behind you, you have a whole bunch of lanyards from a whole bunch of conferences you've gone to, and so I'm guessing you probably have a big collection of bow ties to go with that, given your bow tie now and the one on your uh, profile picture as well. So, how many do you have, and and what's your your favorite one to pull out at a conference? <laughs> so, um, so I get I, I I get asked a lot about bow ties, but I I probably have about thirty. Um, but what's more, um, what what I th I think is, um, a, 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 I wouldn't say impressive. My my wife definitely wouldn't say impressive. I have more shoes than I have bow ties. Um, I am <laughs> I am addicted to Tom's shoes. Um, I love them. I I love the way that you know when I'm up I'm up I'm up on my feet all the time presenting or talking or or, or doing stuff. Um, and I just I absolutely adore them. And and then you know buying one and, and then sending one to someone in need is also a, a huge benefit. But um, so yeah, so I love you know this is this one is one of my favorites. I have some. I have uh, you know camouflage colored ones. I have ones with flip flop beach themes. I have I've got all kinds of stuff. So I try to take bow ties to you know depending on the conference that I'm going to to try and match the theme of where I'm going to be. So um, so in a couple weeks I'm going to be headed out to uh, to North Carolina to NC Ties, which is the ISTE affiliate of North Carolina, my home state. And so I'll take all my beach my beach themed um, bow ties. Or I just got back from from Missouri at um, at METC. And so I took a lot of my wintry, more my my more um, my more a winter collection of bow ties, if you will. So I try to match them up to where I'm going to be. It's just because I have to. I have to to just be different. I have to. It's just a product of who I am. I just have to be different from everybody else. And I already stick out like a Thor, so like a, a sore thumb. I'm six foot four and and have bright orange hair. And so I just figure I just might as well just roll with it and just go all all out. Fantastic. <laughs> So awesome. Um, bringing it back a little, you uh, you helped start the hashtag EdChat. Can you tell us a little bit about the value of PLN and EdChats? So definitely. So so Tom Whippy and Shelly Terrell and I um, started EdChat back in 2008. And it has been explosive from there. And, and, and just if, if, if one was to look at Twitter today, you know the number of educational chats. There's well over 300 educational chats that take place on Twitter, um, and and EdChat was by no means the first educational hashtag, um, but it, it it kind of set the stage for for a lot of the the chats that you see today. And and there, there's a, there's a reason for that. There there's a need out there for educators to work together, for educators to come together, to share ideas, to reflect with one another. And you know, social media has empowered and made that process a lot easier. Now, there, there's always been connections amongst educators for as long as educators have been working together. We've we've all had uh, we, we all had personal learning networks before social media through the the other educators in our building. What social media does is open up those networks to thousands and thousands of other people that may not be in your building, may not be in your district. So it, it really it begins to show you again all the great things that are happening out there. So if you take, for instance, the Young Educators Network um, on, on the in the in the ISTE communities, you know you, you've got a, a a, a large following of, of educators who are who who are just starting out in their careers, or who um, who who are looking for advice, looking for help. You know that that to me, as someone who was who was a who who was a first year teacher who struggled as a first year teacher who didn't have anybody to talk to, I tell people all the time, I was a terrible teacher. 
had I know now what I knew, had I know then what I knew now, I would have been I would have been a much better teacher for the students that I taught because I would have been reaching out. I would have had those connections. I would have had those educators in other areas and to bounce ideas off of, to reflect with, to to grow and to learn from. It, it social media has made that process easier. So through through it, be a, be a hashtag, be a community, be a Google Plus group. You know whatever it is. The, the value of connecting with other with other educators can can't be expressed enough. There are so many there's so many great stories, and that's in our in in Tom and mine's book, The Relevant Educator. We talk about a lot of those stories, not just for us personally, but for other educators as well, with how they have grown themselves, not only professionally but personally in their learning as well. And so that value is 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 tremendous the the hardest part though that we that we we see is 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 overcoming that hurdle of just getting started once you get started once you drink the Kool-Aid per se and, and you jump in uh, i think anybody who who's done it for for any period of time will attest that it it really it, it provides a lot of value to their own personal and professional learning that's awesome steven so i see we have a question from the audience so let me field that one then i have a question for you uh, Laura is asking, hi, am I in the right place to see the broadcast? The answer is yes. <laughs> yes, you are. Um, question and answers are working. So if you actually, if you're watching live right now, there's a little Q&A button. You can click on that and ask questions. And uh, if it's a question for Steven or any of us, we'll, we'll circle back to that a little bit later. So I just selected that as a question. Have you guys played with questions and answers yet? Not yet. You are right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, awesome. So we are done with questions. There's just just the one. Um, so, Stephen, you mentioned your book. You've written a lot of books, dude. A lot. <laughs> We're up to three now. Three. I had three come out in the span of four and f four months. Wow. wow. Um, so, my question is, as someone who just struggles to blog at this point, like monthly. How, what's your workflow like? Do you have a, a schedule in life where you actually block out that time and make that sacred? Is it like an hour every morning? Um, do you have like a workflow or a schedule? How do you how do you do it? Yeah. So the, the, my my first my first thing I tell people is don't agree to write three books at the same time. Um, don't don't ever do that. And and granted that you know they're they're sh they're short form books, which I love the short forms. I love. Um, how digestible they are, which you know, it's not. You're not writing a 400-page text, which it, which which is a lot easier. Um, but uh, for me, I so I have two young kids. So they, I have a five-year-old and an 18-month-old, and and my girls, um, you know, they it's, they go to bed, and and I spend time with my wife, and then everybody goes to bed, and then I work, and so I will stay up really late and work, and then I get up pretty early and work, and. So it just depends on what I'm working on. So with, with my books, what I did was I tried to work on it a little bit each day because I knew that that my deadlines were coming, and I'm not one of these people who works well under pressure. Uh, and so I, I like to know that the things are going to be done before before the deadline starts looming. So um, I would write for an hour a day, um, and a lot of times, uh, a lot of that writing never made it into the book. And so it would be it would end up somewhere else. I would use it for a blog post, or I would use it in another way. Um, but what I love about writing is I as I was growing up, in, my English classes were the worst classes. I absolutely. I was a math and a science person. I loved. Very, I was very analytical, and I still. I still very much am. But what I've loved about writing and just the act of writing is it's very reflective for me. Um, it just. It, it. It helps me really process what I'm trying to say and what I'm trying to do. And um, I've had to overcome a lot of my. If I go back and I read my very first blog post, it's remarkably different from the last one that I wrote. And it's not that I've become an expert in writing. It's not that I've become even any good that anybody wants to read anything I've written. But it's for me personally, I feel like I'm able to better articulate what I want to say through my writing. And it's just, it's just do it. Just if you have a, if you have an idea for a book, I just got asked this the other day about writing books. If you have an idea for a book, write it. Don't, don't, don't wait for somebody to say, hey, will you write us a book? Write it. And with the beauty of, of self-publishing and being able to put things online yourself, you can do that right now and, and offer that up to the world and, and share what you're learning. And, and the same thing can be true for kids, you know. So if you have something you want to share, a lot of people are blogging now. Turn your blog into a book. You know, if your blog has a theme, take that and turn it into a book. You know, it, it, you could have something there that, um, that, that the, the world needs to see. So just, just write. Just figure out a time that you can do it. Set aside the time and just, and just write. 
That's awesome. All right, I'm going to start writing. <laughs> but not tonight. I'm on a podcast tonight. I'll start tomorrow, which I said yesterday. <laughs> Maybe you could write a book about procrastination. I could, yeah. <laughs> or a book about podcasts. That's actually a good idea. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, thanks for joining us tonight. We'll see you now. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I have a follow-up for you. Um, I don't know if it's your latest book. I don't even have them in order. But uh, you're talking about content curation. Mm -hmm. And um, I read it almost as like taking professional development and personalizing it. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Like, How do you accomplish that? How do you actually make it, you know, just instead of this, how do you drink from the fire hose? Yeah, so a lot of, a lot of teachers don't know yet that they don't have to learn what their district has prescribed to them in terms of their professional learning. There are other things out there for them. And so, again, the beauty of social media is that you can plug in any time and learn. And there are many different ways to personalize that, to personalize your learning. But before you even begin to personalize your own learning, you have to understand yourself as a learner and understand what is it that you want to do with your learning. So maybe you, um, and again, this is where the this is where writing and blogging especially helps is being reflective. So if you reflect on your practice, what is it that you do really well in, with your with your teaching, and what is it that you re, that you struggle with, and and really try to to be be reflective and think about okay, I'm really struggling with with you know helping helping individualize learning for students. Okay, so you know that's an area for growth for you. So you're going to spend your time looking and and finding places to to figure out how to learn those things. Now. That is the challenge. That's the, the thing that I get asked all the time. Is I can I know what I'm weak in, but where do I even begin? I think there. I think I really think there are three places. I think Twitter hashtags. I think is one that if you even if you don't tweet, even if you don't ever send one tweet, you can still search for Twitter hashtags. You can still find hashtags and find the benefit of using hashtags for your own learning. Um, Jerry Blumengarden, Cyberman Man One, has a wonderful collection of. Of, uh, of, of Twitter chats. There's a Twitter chat list so you can see the times that each of these individual chats and you know no matter what subject you teach, what grade level you teach, um, where you teach, there's, there is probably a state level chat for you where other educators are gathering. So you can, you can begin to make those connections with people. Another are, are the, I, I love the ISTE communities. I think those are a great place, but a lot of professional organizations, whether it's ISTE or um, you know, many of the other you know, specific professional organizations have a lot of those communities. And so plugging into those communities and, and engaging with other educators in an asynchronous way could be a great thing. And then I'm a huge fan of EdWeb. I love the EdWeb webinars. I think they're wonderful. I think that they really get at the heart of, of what um, what teachers really need, and I think those can be a great way too. So the, the, the key is to find those places that you want to learn and what you want to learn, and then finding the right people to help to help uh, to, to help in that learning. The other thing too is be selfish with your learning. So I tell people, you know, when I go to conferences, I'm not a drive-by presenter. So I'm not a, somebody who goes to a conference for the day they present and then leave. I stay for the entire conference. I was just in Texas for five days at TCEA, um, and I only presented the 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 second to last day. I could have just been there Thursday and gone home. I stayed there Monday through Friday because. I'm very selfish with my learn. I want to learn too. I want to be a learner too. So I go to sessions. I take the time, like at ISTE, you know. I go to sessions. I I learn with other people. I I try to push myself, and you know, I'm not a big believer in flipped classroom, but I go to flipped classroom sessions because I'm trying. To, I'm trying to better understand them. I'm trying to understand them for my own learning. So. Be selfish with your learning too, and go to you know just because everybody's going to that great presenter, you know. Oh yeah, sure. Do I want people to come to my sessions? Yes, of course I want people to come to my sessions. But if my session doesn't meet your needs, and there's a better session that you could go to with somebody who may not have name recognition or who may not be edu famous or whatever it is, that they're what they're going to be talking about in that session is going to better fulfill that learning objective that you have for yourself. Go to that session. You can always catch up with those presenters that you missed later on. The, the key is to just put yourself out there and figure it out. Figure out what do you want to learn and how, how are, what are those places you can go to be a better learner. 
Um, to kind of piggyback off of that, we actually have a question from Simon in our online community. Um, and the question he asks is, is there potential for other social media platforms to be used in interesting ways to help students learn? I know we're learning from all those things as well. Um, for example, he's, he asks, is there a way we can make Instagram, Snapchat, Tumblr, et cetera, an ex ed educational space as well? Yeah, I think I definitely think Tumblr is it could be a great place. You know, that again, that reflective blogging, um, it, it's a very a very social platform to be able to um, to post things. I think Google Plus could be is a great a great way because there's not a lot of the social noise that's involved in Google Plus as there is with Facebook. And so um, I and I just did a I just um, did an interview for um, for someone about how Google Plus can be used for PLNs and and how it can be a really great place to um, to uh, to to form those those relationships because it's not most people if they're going to be social where they're going to go they're going to go to Facebook but yeah there's a lot of people on Facebook but it's also it could also be very distracting for learning so especially with younger learners so with with students so you know Google Plus community could be a great place to do that um, but yeah I definitely think you know it's, there there are opportunities to to use where students are with the application that students use and turn them into an opportunity to teach them not only the right ways how to use those platforms are the right way to use Snapchat or the right way to use Google Plus or the right way to interact with people, but also show them that learning can take place in multiple different mediums in multiple different ways. I love that. Awesome. We have one more question on our Q&A, then we're going to jump to our favorite recent ed tech tools. Um, educator Tom Whitby asks, how is it working with that dynamic, passionate educator Tom Whit... Aww. <laughs> Dude. All right, we're done answering that question. <laughs> can I plead the fifth? <laughs> I I will I will go on. I love I love Tom to, I love Tom to death. Tom and I are getting ready to fly to Dubai. Tom and I have a have a crazy knack of when we travel together. We like to fly on seventeen hour flights together. And so he and I are getting ready to go to, to Dubai for a conference in the in the middle of March. And um, I relish the opportunity because it's it's a chance for us to just uh, just sit and talk and and um, and and plan things together. And I I love Tom as a business partner. I love Tom as a friend and. Uh, and he's he is he's one of the best things to ever happen to me personally and professionally. Awesome, Robert. I see you're first in our uh, next segment. Favorite edtech tool? Oh, yes. Let's so I'll one. just flash it up real quick. So my favorite edtech tool right now is Moonshots in Education um, by the um, amazing uh, journalism English teacher from Palo Alto High School, Esther. I believe it's Wojcicki. Um, so definitely it's all about blended learning in the classroom. I just started reading it, um, but definitely it's one to check out. Real quick, what I have is, if you haven't tried it already, which I'm sure you have, is Skitch, which is a great app for um, annotating um, out of the people from Evernote, and it's really good with app layering or app smashing, whatever you want to call it. Like a lot of my students are using it when they create something and then move it to their book and things like that. And then real quick, another cool one that I just have been using with some students in fifth grade are is called Storyboard That. So if you want to get away from maybe using Comic Life and try storyboarding online, it is an account, um, but you you can do a free trial to see if you like it. Uh, mine would be Vid Stitch, um, and the reason why I like it is because it's a great way to explain things. Because you can have, um, you can do like a little collage of your pictures, and then you can also have a video in there, so students can kind of explain their thinking with the pictures around them. Just a cool one. That's awesome. And uh, my new favorite is Dropcam. It's been around for a while. You just It's USB-powered webcam that you can share or not. Uh, and up in our tower at my school, at Hillbrook School, we have um, an owl with a nest, and we climbed up and dropped a Dropcam in. So there's a live feed right now of owls at my school, and they have nine eggs. It's crazy, right? Nine owl eggs. They're barn owls. Like, I saw so owl eggs today. <laughs> so I can't top that. That's really cool. Um, so my, I definitely can't top that. Mine is my my favorites. If this, then that. So and and I actually cover this in my content curation book. But I love being able to automate anything. So if this, then that takes. Um, it, they're called recipes. So you can take 
apps are how things happen on the web, and if something happens, then something else will happen. So some some crazy ones that you know some some pretty basic ones you can do is if someone if if someone um, tweets a picture of you, it'll automatically get saved to your Dropbox, or if someone um, posts uh, a tweet about you, you can save it to a spreadsheet. There's all kinds of those mundane things to do, but some of my favorites are if you have like um, Wemo lights in your house, you can set it up so that if somebody um, mentions you on Twitter, your lights flash. Um, and there's there's all kinds of crazy things you can do with if this and that. And they've they've got some more simpler apps called Do now that um, that really help simplify that that process because it's basically like learning how to code, how to make things apps talk to each other. Yeah, I love that. I was playing with Do over the weekend. <laughs> I was playing with Do. <laughs> uh. Oh my goodness! All right, uh, let's shift gears and uh, step out of that. I want to give a shout out. A lot of people have been using our hashtag Epic Yen. Kristen Sirocco uh, tweeted out last week. She's been busy catching up on some of the old Epic Yen podcasts uh, before she was a member. So, Kristen, welcome to the ISC community. Um, stoked that you're feeling re-inspired. So, Kristen, you are featured Epic Yen. Tweeter, mentioner, and you win nothing yet. <laughs> Do we have anything for her? A shout out. A shout out. And if you want to be mentioned, a little shout out for our next podcast, um, use our hashtag, or you can also post in our online community at isc.org backslash yen. Right, and so we're always looking, of course, for little shout-outs and feedback. Join our Google Plus and ISTE community just to stay connected and keep up with us. And we're excited to announce that our next Google Hangout will be next month, Monday, March 30th at 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And super early bird registration ends March 1st for the ISTE conference. So if you've had enough of looking at the owl eggs um, that Bill has shared with us, um, and you want to take flight yourself, sign up for the early bird registration up on ISTE. Nice. I see what we did with that. that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well played, Robert. All right. So uh, you can find us all on the Twitters. I am at Bill Selleck. I am at Christy Andre, too. I am at Schley Reed. I am at Pronovost. And I'm at Web20 Classroom. Awesome. You guys ready to try and do an epic yen all together? Ready? Three, two, one. Epic, epic yen! yen.